I'm going to read you some of the things that Jesus said about prayer. And then I'm going to ask you a question. Here's some things that Jesus said about prayer. They're pretty terrifying. Luke 11, 9. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Mark 11, 24. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received and it will be yours. So another thing Jesus said about prayer. Let me, let me go on to the next one. John 14, verses 13 to 14. Jesus says this, and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Jesus says this in John 15, seven, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Matthew 21, Jesus says this about prayer. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. And then in Matthew 7, Jesus says this. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? That's what Jesus says about prayer. You know, I love what Jesus says because the extravagance of his promises often confront the religiosity of our unbelief. Surely he didn't mean anything. Surely he didn't didn't really mean that. Like anything, whatever I wish in his name. Friends, I have a theory. And if it's it's this, if we truly believed what Jesus said about prayer, it would be the only thing we would ever want to do. It would be all we as a staff could do to stop you from getting out this place after a 6 to 7 p.m. prayer meeting. In fact, you would be so caught up there, you wouldn't care at all about anything I'm saying right now because you'd be so caught up in conversation with God. You know, later in this series, uh, Cody is going to give a talk on unanswered prayer. And that's really important because hear me, guys, you are going to come up against scenarios in this life where you pray for things for years and nothing happens. And it's really important to understand how to navigate the disappointment of unanswered prayer. But my pastoral read for Tehillah, and again, we're not a church, but we're happy to, to, to be a, a formation place for your discipleship. My pastoral read in conversation with people is that there's an even greater danger for us, Tehila, than unanswered prayer. It's unasked prayer. I think that's a greater danger for us in our spiritual lives right now that we would actually just allow the things we want to talk to God about go kind of underneath our consciousness and we'd never actually vocalize them in conversation with God. So at the start of this new year and in light of these promises from Jesus, I want to take a look at two heroes of the faith that would have formed Jesus's view of prayer. Do you remember those things that Jesus said about prayer? They're still on the board, some of them. They're pretty crazy. So we have to ask ourselves, how did Jesus get to a point where he can say that about God? How did Jesus get to a point where he can confidently say that about prayer? Well, I want to look at two people that I believe formed Jesus's view of prayer. And again, these are two of many, okay? So this is not exhaustive. It's just two that I think God wants us to hone into. And in doing so, I believe God has a prophetic invitation for us to actually embody the lives of these two heroes of the faith. And I believe that in talking through these two ancient stories, we're gonna find ourselves right in the middle of God's outstanding hand for us for 2024. I wanna talk about the audacity of Moses and the faithfulness of Daniel. The audacity of Moses and the faithfulness of Daniel. If you've got a Bible on you, you can open up to Exodus 32, 9 and 14. But before we read that, I'm gonna pray for us. God, we want the real thing. God, forgive us for not taking seriously the invitation to prayer. Father, I pray that in this moment, you would grip our heart for what is possible when a people commit to seeking you. Father, I pray that you form in us the audacity of of Moses and the faithfulness of Daniel. We just command any spirits of distraction to leave this place. We take authority over any lies of the enemy that would seek to steal, kill, and destroy what you're doing in this room. We command them to leave in Jesus' name. God, give us focus and clarity to hear what you're saying. 
Grant us attention. In Jesus' name, amen. Exodus 32, 9 to 14. You guys hanging in? Great. So context here. Our good friend Mo is on the top of Mount Sinai talking with God. I call it Mo because we're on a first name basis. Uh, God has brought the Israelites out of captivity in Egypt and raised up Moses to be their leader. Many of you know this story. The narrative picks up with Moses on the mountain writing down the law, the covenant that Yahweh is making with his people. And the goal of God in this setting isn't to free his people just to give them more rules. His goal is to free them and then give them instructions about how to live with his presence in their midst. So God invites Moses up to help form a faithfulness, a covenant, where he can actually reestablish what was lost in the Garden of Eden, unbroken, unhindered communion with God himself. But right as Moses and God are kind of hashing this out, hashing this out the Israelites start to get a bit of ADHD. Takes one to know one. Moses is taking too long, and they get a little bit jittery. You know? Waiting at the doctor's office, start doing this. Anyway, that's how I see Israel. Um, the Israelites go to Aaron, who's Moses' brother, and they ask him to make for them a God that they can worship. So the Israelites get Aaron to do for them what Moses said he was going to do for them. Give them a God that they could be in proximity to. And it's important we stop here before moving on because many of us think idolatry is, rebirth, is birthed in rebellion, but that's not actually true. The seed of idolatry is sown in impatience. The seed of idolatry is sown in impatience. Often when God wants to give us something that will really bless us, it takes time. It takes time. And the greater the thing God wants to give you, the more waiting you might actually have to do. And in that place of waiting, our hearts are tested because will we actually trust God to do the thing that God has said, or will we begin to rely on other things and thus form a seed of idolatry in our heart? So in response to Israel's answering the seed of idolatry, he gets pretty angry. And, and, and it's, it's totally justified. God, you have to remember in the story, God just literally moved heaven and earth to get these people out of slavery, and now they're setting up an idol. And God basically looks at Moses and says, I keep trying to get this thing back on track, but these people keep messing up. So what I'm going to do, Moses, is I'm going to restart this whole project with you. I'm going to abandon Israel, and you, Moses, will become the guy I use to restore Eden on the earth once for all. If you have your Bible or a device, it's verse 9. God says this, I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are a stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that, may, so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you, Moses, into a great nation. And then Moses does something incredible. Verse 11 says this, but Moses sought the favor of the Lord his God. Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say? It was with evil intent that Yahweh brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to wipe them off the face of the earth. Turn from your fierce anger, God. Relent and do not bring disaster on your people. God, remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, to whom you swore by your own self. And he quotes God. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give your descendants all this land I promised them, and it will be their inheritance forever. Verse 14, we're going to camp out here. Then the Lord relented. Then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. In a remarkable moment when others would walk away, shrugging their shoulders in sort of an apathetic resignation, saying to themselves, well, you know, I did my best. I, I gave it my best shot. Moses does something incredible. He stands on behalf of God for his people and seeks God's favor and blessing. Moses sees the inevitable consequences of the sin of his people. He sees that they're inevitably going to be destroyed. And instead of letting it happen, he doubles down and cries out for mercy. The ancients said this kind of prayer was to, quote, prevail with God himself in protest. And I love that. Moses places himself right in the middle of God and the rebellion of his people and basically says, hey, God, I think I have a better idea. And God says, you know what? I think you might be right. In verse 14, the word relented is a translation of the Hebrew word naham, which can also be translated as changed his mind or even repented. God nahamed. 
God changed his mind. He repented. That is really what the text says. And we got to let that screw up our theology for a second. I want us to sit in this tension and not move past it, that God moves in response to his friend. According to one of the most ancient stories of literally all time, it's true, God changes his mind. And that doesn't mean that God is repenting of sin. It doesn't even mean that God was in the wrong. It means that God was moved emotionally. Scholarly consensus is that Moses' prayer moves God on an emotional level. And so when Jesus' paradigm of prayer is being formed as a boy, he's thinking about prayer this way. I move God. Now, this seems a bit offensive to us, but it's not because of what you think. We in the Western world live with a theological hangover from a very strange time in Christian history. Um, and, and we've come to think of God as what Aristotle called the unmoved mover. Just hang on for me. Hang on, hang on with me for, for a quick second. This is going to get a little bit nerdy, but it's important. This idea of God takes the shape of a dude that is sort of stone-faced and ironclad. Basically, a God that's created a universe, put all things into motion, and then is just like, boom, removes himself from it. A God that is now emotionally and spiritually removed from the events of the world he created. The Greeks sort of conceived conceived of this idea of God who started all things but is now no longer involved. And basically when Christianity became the de facto religion of the West in around 300, 400 uh, AD in an attempt to evangelize, the Christian apologists and preachers basically moved Yahweh into this category of the quote unmoved mover that Aristotle and the Greeks thought about. So, so, and, and that's true. God, God, God is the first cause of the universe. That was their attempt. Is they're trying to show people God, the, the, this idea of God you have in your society, it's actually our God. It's actually Yahweh, Genesis 1. He's there at the beginning of all times. So they're, they're making this move to try to get God into the conscious. But the results of how we perceive God is actually catastrophic. So what ends up happening is we perceive God as this unmoved mover. And for centuries after, God's nature and his sovereignty was understood in a very Greek way, not a Hebrew way. Yahweh is not the unmoved mover of Aristotle, friends. He is the dynamic and relational God of Moses and Daniel. He is a God who never breaks his covenant with those he loves, despite their disobedience. And at the heart of this story is a man so confident in God's commitment to him that he feels comfortable enough to disagree with God. The story communicates that God in his purest form is the, is the most pure relational being that has ever existed and that God listens to you and I and cares about what you and I have to think and say. He responds. And this may seem radical, but that's only because most of us have a concept of God formed more, formed more by the Greeks than, Hebrew, than the Hebrew God of Moses and Jesus. Blaise Blaise Pascal was a a French polymath, and he said this about Moses' encounter with God. He said, God has bestowed on us the dignity of being causes. God has bestowed on us the dignity of being causes. Now, if you're not a philosophy major, you have no idea what that means. Here's what it means. This basically means that God gives you and I an active role in participating in shaping the events of the earth. And this doesn't call into question God's sovereignty. He's sovereign. Right? He's in control of all things at all times. But it, it, his declaration and his end goal for humanity, it's the renewal of all things. What he's promised will happen. So the destination is secure. But how we get to that destination, friends, that he leaves open to you and I. Because he cares and he loves and he wants to co-rule and co-reign with us. Richard Foster says this about this kind of prayer. He says, we are not locked into a present determinist future. Ours is an open, not closed universe. We are co-laborers with God, working with God to determine the outcome of events. In other words, your prayers change things. They move God. And when God is moved, the earth moves. This kind of audacity in prayer is built on two things, friendship and identification. Much has been said recently about arguing, God, about arguing with God in recent years. It's become pretty trendy for like, you know, celebrity pastors and stuff to talk about, like, oh, argue with God and all this kind of stuff. It kind of gets the Instagram highlights going, you know, the reels. 
But we need to take note that Moses is friends with God before he ever contends with God. Before a syllable come out, comes out of Moses' mouth of suggestion of, hey, this actually isn't the best idea. Moses is saying that from a history of friendship that's been built. Moses has cultivated a friendship, and because of this friendship, Moses' prayer centers around God's reputation more than his own. For a lot of us, when we think about wrestling with God or arguing with God, we actually do it within a matrix of our own preferences. Our conception of arguing with God is we don't like something, rubs us the wrong way, we don't really like how things are going, and so we just kind of wrestle with God about it because that's not what we want or desire. And you know what, that's okay, he loves you. Like you're not gonna go wrong by wrestling with God about things you don't like. He's a good dad, he loves you. So you can do that, it's okay. But Moses' priority here, Moses' priority here, excuse me, is not his own preferences. It's God's fame. Moses reminds God of God's own nature. He doesn't tell God that God is wrong because he's driven by preferences. He looks at God and says, God, if you do this, how are people gonna think about you? If this actually happens, people won't know you as the just, good, holy God that I know you as. So audacity in prayer begins when we become jealous for God to be seen rightly by the people of the earth. The power and the audacity of your bold prayers finds its origins in jealousy for God to be seen rightly. And one of the reasons our prayers don't have that fuel, don't have that unction, that power, is because deep within us, we care more about our preferences than God's fame. So if we wanna have audacity in prayer, we need to be jealous for God to be seen rightly on the earth. The second thing that Moses does that this blows me away every time is he identifies with the brokenness of the world rather than his own righteousness. To have this kind of audacity means that you need to identify with the broken, with the brokenness of the situation or people you find, uh, sorry. To have this kind of audacity with God means you need to identify with the brokenness of the situation or the people that you find yourselves in or around. Part of the reason why our prayers are powerless, friends, is because our hearts aren't bleeding. Spiritual power is unlocked when we identify with the brokenness and depravity and sin of our generation. That's where power in prayer is found. Spiritual power begins when we stand in the gap for people and we, and we cry out for mercy. Let me give you some examples. Abraham identifies with Sodom and Gomorrah, asking God to spare the evil cities for the sake of 10 righteous people. Moses identifies with Israel when he could easily leave them to suffer the inevitable destruction of their sin. Elijah identifies with the sin of his generation and prays for rain. And Jesus identifies with the sin of the world and steps into reality so that we might be made whole. You have to identify to feel the pain of the world around you. And listen, the greatest antidote to the disease of spiritual showmanship, to the disease of showing up at Tehila and performing your spirituality, but it never being real, the greatest antidote to that is having your heart broken for what breaks God's. It's when you, like, like when you have a cry in you for justice and suffering to end on the earth, your selfish ambition doesn't stand a chance. The pride of your life and the selfish desires of your heart cannot compare to feeling what God feels for the earth. And some of us in here, we're waiting for God to deliver us from hidden sin. But listen, can I just tell you my story and the reason why I don't struggle with hidden sin, why I no longer lie and manipulate, why the pride of my heart and the desire for significance is decreasing daily? Can I tell you why? It's because I'm possessed by a vision of what God could do in my generation. And I'm sold out to it. So listen, when you have the burden of God in you, your time becomes redeemed. You don't wake up wondering why you're alive. You just feel this passionate desire to bring the kingdom to earth. And every single calling has its origins in that place. So I think this year, God is calling us to become like Moses, audacious, audacious in prayer, to stand in the gap, to feel what God feels for a generation, to shake apathy off, look God in the face and say, have mercy, God. 
Save this planet, save this people, save my family. Because friends, you never know what's on the other side of a very bold, audacious prayer. Now at this point, we run into a problem. Because if we build a theology around this moment, we end up in a lot of danger. I don't know about you, but the reality is my prayer time in the morning looks a lot less like me on top of a mountain face to face with the God who cast the sun into the sky than it does me groggily saying the Lord's prayer with crusties in my eyes and dragon breath because there was a draft in the room and I breathed through my mouth accidentally. It's like, it's like, it's like, like you get up and you go to pray and you're like, the Lord is my shepherd. You're like, I need mouthwash before I do that. I'm I'm offending God right now. He can't even come near me because that thing's so bad. You're holy. Oh, dude, you know what I mean? Like, spirit's like, I can't get near that guy. There's another story that would have formed Jesus. You know what I mean? It's like, you go to pray and like, like all I can think about is just red Adidas gazelles. You know, I'm just like, God, I want, man, I want red Adidas gazelles. Oh, so bad. And God's like, I'm right here. Can we just keep, can we finish Psalm 23? Like, that'd be great. Can we just get through that? I'm like, yeah, but red Adidas gazelles. Oh, God, those are... Anyway, there's another story that would have formed Jesus' convictions on prayer, except this is not a story about holding off potential judgment and audaciousness in prayer. This story is about the power of a routine. This story is about how the supernatural is actually most experienced in the mundane. If you have a Bible or a device, please open to Daniel 6. Daniel chapter six, verses six to 10. So we pick up Daniel's story here. And there's a few important things to note. Daniel is an exile in Babylon. He would have been taken from his home when he was around early to mid teens, you know, 13, 16 years old. He's in exile in Babylon for 66 years, 66 years. We often think of Daniel in the lion's den as this like buff trim dude with like a nice beard and crystal blue eyes. I have no idea how that happened. But at this point in the story, assuming he's well into his exile, he's probably around 70 or 80. So dude is not young. What we're about to read is happening at the end of Daniel's life. And during his life, it's important to note, Daniel had three, maybe even four kings rule over him. All of them are idol worshiping kings. And all of them, every single one, wants to be worshiped as God. And every single one of them ends up confessing that there's one true God and it's Daniel's God. And we love Daniel for it. But see, few of us read these stories and, and, and we realize the detail that the text says that, that sews together everything that Daniel did. So just before the, dex, the, just before the text we're reading, Daniel has become so distinguished among the advisors and the rulers of the kingdom that he's in that basically there's a plot against him. Uh, he's a foreigner in the land, so probably experiencing some, some, some racism of some sense. And these other leaders that he's around get jealous, so they try to find a way to get him out because he's the king's favorite at this point, right? You got, a lot of you guys know the story. But they try, to, they try to figure out a way that they can get him out, but they find no corruption in Daniel because, as the text says, he's neither corrupt nor negligent. So finally, they derive a plot against Daniel to get him out of power uh, in a place of favor. Uh, uh, this is chapter 6, verse 6. It says this, So these administrators and satraps went as a group to the king and said, May King Darius live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next, during the next 30 days except you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing and stamped his seal on it. Let's hone in on verse 10. When Daniel learned the decree had been published, what did he do? He went home to his upstairs room and opened the windows towards Jerusalem. And there, three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to God, just as he had done before. Some translations end this verse saying, just as he had done since his youth. See, we all know the story of Daniel in the lion's den. We all know that Daniel was given pretty significant visions and dreams. Uh, Some we're still trying to figure out to this day. But we often miss this divine thread that bound all these moments together. We love the revelations. 
We love Daniel's courage. We love Daniel's skill and his knowledge, his excellence and his wisdom. But the thread that bound it all together was daily faithfulness in prayer. It's funny, most of us read the stories laid out in the book of Daniel. We just think like, oh man, this dude was just caught up. Like he's in like Paul's 12th heaven at that point. You know what I mean? Like you, you read about the things that he's seen and he's just like, was it a NASA trip? Like, is God moving? You know, what's going on? Like some of the stuff he's seeing is so crazy. You think that this guy's just so spiritual, right? But it was the daily grind of faithful, old fashioned, boring prayer showing up when nothing seemed to be happening. It was the routine, mundane reality of showing up at the same place, the same time, every day, telling God he loved him, contending for those he loved, sacrificing his time and energy for the sake of others. It wasn't exciting. There was no E minor chords and no Michael Larson. There was no Tehillah worship. It was boring and sweaty and mundane and routine. And just let your mind wonder what this would look like for your own life. Daniel starts praying when he's young every day, three times a day. A year goes by, nothing. A decade, nothing. Five more years, three times a day, nothing. Then out of nowhere, boom, angel comes. Visitation, revelation, insight into political realms, right? God touches him, God equips him. The fate of the nation changes. A king comes to know God, but then the evil king, the evil king gets replaced by another evil king and Daniel's crushed. Heartache. We were so close. What does Daniel do? Same thing. Just wake up three times a day. Prayer. Five years goes by. Ten years goes by. Nothing. Another five years. Boom. Out of nowhere. Angelic visitation. Revelation and insight given to him. A dream, insight, knowledge into what is happening in the political realms. And uh, an evil king is overthrown. Hallelujah. God did his thing. The evil king that was overthrown is now replaced by a more evil king. What does Daniel do? Same thing, faithful in prayer every day, three times a day. Back to his room on his knees. God, you're my God. Earnestly, I seek you. See, for every mountaintop of glorious encounter, there's been a history of faithfulness that's been sown in the mundane. Some of us are in this room seeking a breakthrough, a revelation, an insight from God. Well, what if it takes you one, two, three, four, five, ten 10 years of faithful prayer? Friends, desire without consistency is just good intention. And you can't follow Jesus on good intentions. The danger a lot of us face is we think it's enough to come here and experience heightened desire. Are you with me? You come to Tehillah, you love the worship, you hear somebody preach a word, and you desire God more but then it ends. And you think that because you had that moment of desire that that was growth, but it's not. We think we're growing. We trick ourselves into thinking that we're following Jesus because we come come to Tehillah and experience an increased desire to spend time with God, but it doesn't translate over into our life. You know, it's amazing because what you're seeing in this text isn't Daniel praying three times a day because that's when he could fit it in. No, you're seeing a man in a completely pagan nation with three other God-fearing friends who's deliberately operating off the customs and and rhythms that his ancestors taught him. For thousands of years, the people of God would pray three times a day. So Daniel isn't finding time for prayer. He's ordering his whole life around prayer. And at this point, we have to be challenged because Daniel, Daniel's praying three times a day in a culture like Babylon. And if he's doing that, I'm pretty sure we can have a regular habit of prayer in a city like Calgary. So often prayer is the last thing we ever think of putting on our schedules. But according to Daniel, if you build your life around a rhythm of prayer, you might just change a nation. In fact, the reason for prayer, the, the, the reason prayer for us doesn't really do anything a lot of the times is purely due to our lack of consistency. Later on in Daniel's life, uh, before he's about to die, he's visited by an angel that gives clarity and insight. You have to remember, right? Like every angelic visitation that Daniel had probably happened like once every 10 or so years. So in between these things you're reading in the book of Daniel is just years of faithfulness, okay? This angel comes and Daniel's old at this point, like really old. 
And all the while, Daniel's kept his custom, and the angel comes down, and he says this, and, and, and he gives wisdom and insight. But the most important thing he says for our conversation tonight is the first thing. It's in Daniel 10. He says, Daniel, you who are highly esteemed. And then a couple verses later, he says this, don't be afraid, Daniel, for from the first day you set your heart to understand and humble yourself before God, your words were heard. And I've come in response to those words. Highly esteemed from the very first day. Your translation might say greatly treasured. From the very first day of his youth all the way into his 80s, after all those decades of daily showing up in prayer, when nothing was seemingly happening, he was being heard. When we commit ourselves to a daily discipline of faithful prayer, all of heaven hearkens to us. Your faithfulness so moves the heart of God that the angels speak of you in hushed tones, you who are highly beloved. Like when God sees Adam waking up early in the morning, barely audibly praying because he can't focus, heaven goes, oh, he's doing it again. And they stand in attention on the edge of their seat, all the angels, just because I call on his name. Every groundbreaking encounter has been sown in years of faithful, uneventful prayer where seemingly nothing happens. If we're gonna answer the call of God to climb the mountain like Moses, we also need to be aware it's gonna require the faithfulness of Daniel. It's gonna require a persistence and a desire that outlasts all feelings, all goosebumps, every high and every low. As the band, you, you guys can come back up. We're gonna land the plane here a bit, but... Guys, I, I just feel like I'm here to tell you that a steadfast life of prayer will never go out of style. Like that'll never be old school. That'll never be old school. A faithful life of seeking God on a constant basis. Like, come on, we have to return to the ancient paths. We gotta look at what worked throughout Christian history, what catalyzed moves of God, and we just gotta imitate that. There's no new thing. The new thing is the old thing. Let's just keep doing what other people have done throughout Christian history. It's time that we arise as a generation and say, come hell or heaven, I'll be one that's found faithful in prayer. I'll be one that shows up in the midst of the mundane because I promise you, if you go home tomorrow and you start waking up in prayer, it's gonna seem boring. But on the other end of years of faithfulness will be encounters and a changed nation and promises revealed and God showing himself to you and it will all be worth it. It will all be worth it. Tehillah, there's an invitation for 2024, and I think it's this. God wants us to have the audacity of Moses, to climb the mountain and boldly stand before the throne of heaven on behalf of our generation, crying out, have mercy, God. And God is also inviting us to embody the faithfulness of Daniel, a life that leaves indents on the ground from the consistency of the presence of our knees offering our love daily before the Lord, despite how we may feel. And friends, we need both. Because a life based on the mountaintop moments will lead you astray. You'll be hooked on a feeling and suffer the consequences of building a faith based on emotion. And a life of daily faithfulness without ever seeking those moments will just be dry and barren. It'll lower your expectations of what God can do. But friends, a life with the audacity of Moses and the faithfulness of Daniel, you can sign me up for that. You can sign me up for a life of seeking him. You can sign me up for a life of showing up every single day despite what I feel. And you can sign me up for a life of climbing the mountain and contending with God for the sake of my generation. I'll do that. Because I'm not gonna get hooked on one or the other. You know, people say the story of God has three main parts to it, the story we're a part of. Creation, decreation, and restoration. In the beginning, God made humanity and the earth for unbroken union. God, out of his love and his own Trinitarian nature, created the cosmos in one profound act of love and creativity. God made everything in original except for one thing, that was us. We're the only thing in the entire created order that is unoriginal. We're a copy of him made in his likeness. 
God forms us out of the dirt and breathes his breath into our lungs. Ruach, as the Hebrew calls it. He takes dust and bone and puts spirit in it, a soul and a mind. And when we awake, the first thing we see is not the dirt of the earth or the blue of the sky, but the face of God. And God gives his people in that place the rarest of things, authority. The first commission humanity ever received is to actually join God in governing the earth, continually involved with God's creative force in bringing order to chaos, goodness where there is none. And we walk with God for some time and then we choose our own way. We become tempted by an existence that's offered to us where we are the Lord of our, of our own lives, an existence where we determine our own way. So we decide to define reality on our own terms, good and evil, right and wrong. We betray our maker and lose our union with him and in so doing, substitute our authority to our enemy. Sith, Sith, sin, death, hate, murder, and injustice enter the world like a disease. It infects everything. And then God sets out on rescue mission after rescue mission. He tries Noah, tries Abraham, tries Moses in the law, tries David. None of it works. Finally, God enters into the human story. God enters into the human story and actually allows his own creation to hate him. God puts on flesh and then he becomes murdered by the ones he made. The people who are supposed to love him most, the people he walked with all that time ago in the garden are the ones that rip the flesh off his back. The people he made use whips laced with broken pottery to strip God himself of the flesh he so humbly took on. God is led to die by the ones who he breathed life into so long ago. Then God dies. He gives himself as a sacrifice for you and me. He dies so you and I don't have to. Three days later, God raises from the dead and he's holding the keys of death hell in the grave. The ancient enemy of humanity that was let into the world as, and has been pillaging it ever since is now locked up. And Jesus holding death sums up his victory in the famous words, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. The same authority we lost in the garden has been won back in the victory of Jesus. Jesus claims for us what we could not claim for ourselves, right standing with God based on trust and allegiance to Jesus. Those who trust in this Jesus, to them are given the right to become children of God. And upon Jesus' ascension to rule above all powers and authority, that same victorious spirit that rules over death and occupies Christ now comes and baptizes us, bringing us back into perfect union with God. What was lost in the garden is now restored. Jesus makes us his temple. After all these thousands of years, finally God can interact freely with his people. And Jesus now is occupied doing one thing in the spirit with him for all eternity. The spirit that has brought order to the chaos of the world, implementing the victory of God in our life. Guess what that spirit is doing? He's praying. And he's looking for us to join him. <laughs> 